All right. Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thanks for tuning in uh, into this uh, talk. I hope you enjoyed the, the keynotes. Uh, my name is Konstantin. I'm doing product management at Viverica, um, mostly around the, the commercial product. Um, before that, I, I worked as a solution architect there um, and um, yeah, helped customers um, and, and the wider Flink community um, to get the most out of Flink. And um, this talk is kind of a summary of uh, some of the things that I've seen there that, that didn't go so well. Um, maybe maybe two things um, be, before I start. Um, when I say worst practices, it's not necessarily worst. It's just a collection of, of God shares. So if you find yourself following some of these worst practices, um, it might not, uh, not uh, actually not be the worst. Um, it might actually be exactly the right thing to do in, in your particular use case. Um, the other thing is um, the sl slides are, or the bullet points on the slides are kind of a mixture between good advice and bad advice um, to make it a little bit less confusing. Um, there is this um, devilish uh, smiley on, um, on everything that is actually bad advice. Um, so I hope that makes it a bit less confusing. Um, I've structured the talk around um, a waterfall development process because um, obviously we'll use a waterfall process and not something um, iterative if we're talking about a worst practices talk. Um, we'll start with project setup, um, we'll do analysis, then that's done and we'll start with development. If we have time we'll do some testing, there's go live and there's um, maintenance. So let's start with the product setup. Um, so the the first thing that that you uh, that you want to make sure when you when you start your first Flink product project is that it's really a business critical use case. Lots of management uh, attention, lots um, or very high SLAs, um, and um, yeah, just a business critical use case. Um, when it comes to the team, no prior knowledge, obviously, um, no stream processing knowledge. Maybe also no Java, no distributed system knowledge at all. It's a challenging mix. Don't try to change this by training your people up front and um, don't use the Flink community. Uh, this will just uh, confuse you because of um, everything that's going on there. Of course, all of these things are bad advice. Um, I don't think um, I, I hit that well, uh, very well. Um, if you actually want to, um, if you're actually looking for for training, and um, there there are always opportunities at Flink Forward, if it happens in a in a live setup, um, there are trainings uh, by Verica. We're currently exploring how we can do them remotely too. Um, our self-paced training is currently being contributed to Apache Flink Two. It's already available on the Verica website, and we'll move to the Apache Flink project. So this is a, a standard. Um, beginner training Apache Flink data stream API that you can go through yourself with exercises and, and solutions for them and some theoretical content in between. Um, when it comes to the community, um, yeah, I, I, I cannot emphasize that enough. Um, right to the user mailing list, um, there are there's an ever-growing number of, of threads there, um, currently about 800 per, per month in the last month. Um, you'll get an answer there within a day usually and um, yeah, getting involved there, discussing answers, asking questions um, is, is, is your first step into the, in the, into the community. Uh, Stack Overflow also works pretty well. Um, a lot of my colleagues at Verica are very active there. Um, David, our, um, one of our trainers, um, answers every second question there, I think. Um, so um, that's also a very good resource. If you if you want to to know how not to ask a question on Stack Overflow, I've uh, um, yeah I've I've done a query for the most downvoted Apache Flink questions on Stack Overflow. You can check it out. Um, there's some yeah some gems in there. Um, there's also a, a, a Flink channel in the Apache um, Slack. Um, 
it's not super active, but um, you'll also get get help there. And if you're already using Slack, then this might be the the least um, least friction for you uh, to get help. So that's basically all about product setup. So start with a start with a small product um, or start with something easy. Um, train your people, use the community, um, and and you'll do fine. Um, when it comes to to requirements. Um, the, the the actual actual challenge begins I think and if you if you want to screw up in this area then don't think about consistency and delivery guarantees don't always think uh, or only think about the happy path um, don't think about application evolution and upgrades probably um, you won't make it into uh, production anyway so don't think about that um, don't think about the scale of your problem. If you think about the scale of your problem, you might actually be in the situation where you only pr process, let's say, a thousand records a day, um, or you you end up realizing you only process a thousand records a day, and that you can actually do that in um, in I don't know Google Sheets or so, and don't need don't need Apache Flink for it, um, and of course don't think about the actual business requirements. I want to talk about each of each of these four areas in, in a bit of detail and uh, what I think you, you should actually do there. Um, when it comes to consistency and delivery guarantees, there are basically three questions that you should ask yourself. And um, if you if you have answers to those, then you already know quite a lot about the, the space that you're in. Um, the first one is, do you care about losing records? If you don't care about that, um, then you can don't need checkpointing, um, and you can use any source in Flink. You can use a socket source, for example. If you care about losing records, um, then you need to ask yourself another question, and that is, do you care about correct results? If you don't care about correct results, you can use Flink's checkpointing mode at least once, and you still need to use um, an well, now you need to use replayable sources. Um, so something like Kafka, Kinesis, file system, most of the sources in Flink are replayable. Um, this is because if you don't want to lose records, Flink needs to be able to reprocess the records after um, a failure. So the source needs to be replayable. If you care about correct results, um, then you need to ask yourself yet another question that is, do I care about duplicates in my downstream systems? Um, these duplicates would really be duplicates. They would have the same correct answer in it, but they might be sent out twice. And if you don't care about duplicates, then you're in the most common case, that is checkpointing mode exactly once and a replayable source. If you don't want duplicates downstream, then you, in addition, also need a transactional sync. Um, so now you might ask the question, okay, why would I not always answer yes three times? Um, it's obviously the, the superior behavior. Um, the thing is that there is a trade-off with, mostly with latency here. So if you want latency, let's say, of 200 milliseconds um, reliably, then it will be very hard um, with trans transactional things um, because it basically means you need to get your checkpointing interval reliably under, let's say, 100 milliseconds in that case, and that that's really going to be a challenge. I mean, it depends on the heart rate, depends on the state um, or the state size, the state backend, but it's nothing for your first flink uh, job certainly. So if you're looking at low latency use cases, try to get into at least the checkpointing mode exactly once in replayable sources case. So this case, if you if you can see my mouse, I actually don't know whether people can see my mouse. Mm. So that's about consistency and delivery guarantees. The next um, question was about, or the next area was application upgrades. Um, and there you should, before going into production of also before starting development maybe, uh, you should start thinking about what will be, or what kind of behavior do I want to have? What kind of guarantees do I want to have when I need to make changes to my application? Am I okay in these cases to, to lose all the state, for example? Probably not. Um, I mean, one of the 
big things about Apache Flink is that it that you can carry over state with save points and things like that. So yeah, let's let's quickly go through the basics. Um, while your job is running, it will in only interact with your local state backend, and it reads and writes the state um, with your local state backend that is on the heap for the file system state backend and RocksDB for the RocksDB state backend. Um, then once you want to do an upgrade, um, you'll trigger a save point and that is stored on distrib uh, distributed file system. Then you make the change that you want to do, upgrade the Flink cluster, fix a bug, upgrade your application and so on. And um, before the job starts, it will reload the state from, from the local state backend and then start processing again. So what kind of changes can you do in the, these cases and what are the prerequisites? Let's, let's first look at topology changes. So on the top, you see the topology before the change, on the bottom, um, after the change. And we see that one, um, one task or one operator is missing here. Um, and this is always possible. You can always uh, remove an operator from, from your um, application. Um, only when starting, you need to pass this allow non-restored state flag because now some of the state in your save point is not restored. Then we also see we have a new um, a new operator and a, the new operator will not have any state in the save point, so it will be initialized with an empty state. So in that case, you need to think about how, how do I write the operator or how do I initialize the operator um, in, a, in a sane way um, when it starts from empty state. How can I how can I bootstrap that? Then there are two two more operators which supposedly are the same, um, but Flink doesn't know that. Um, for Flink to know that they are the same, they need to have the same U, um, UID. So in your original job, you have ha um, you must assign a UID to the operator, and then in the your new job. It must have the same UID, and this is how Flink will match the state and the save point to your new job. So that's about topology changes. So as long as you assign UIDs, you keep that flexibility. If you have not assigned UIDs, there are always ways out, but um, yeah, better just assign them. The other part ne uh, next to, to topology changes is uh, state schema evolution. And so what does it mean? Basically, you have your, your data types in, in Java, for example, your classes, and um, you, you can have pretty arbitrary classes that you store state in. And depending on the type of class that you, that you use, you can make certain changes to these classes. So if you use Avro types of link POJOs, this is pretty flexible, you can add um, or remove um, fields to these, um, to these classes, for example, and Flink will automatically, um, yeah, will automatic automatically migrate the state to the new um, class type for you, um, basically following a couple of rules. Of course, Flink cannot make up data for you. If you add a new field that is not in the, in the old state, then it will be empty. Um, where should the data come from? But, um, it, generally, this works for Avro types and Flink photos. It doesn't work for Cryo. Cryo is the fallback um, in, in the Flink serialization um, stack. So if you if, and and Cryo is kind of a black box to Flink. So if you if you do an upgrade, um, there's no way for Flink to know whether your new Cryo type and your old Cryo type are in any way compatible. So if you use Cryo, you cannot change um, the schema of your state objects. The, your key um, state objects can never um, can never be changed. Um, generally, all these uh, all these um, state evolution topics um, you can work around with uh, the state processor API. So if you need to make an incompatible change, this could always be the case. If there are bigger changes in, in the pipeline, then um, since I think Flink 1.9. We have the state processor API um, with which you can load a, sa a save point and create a new save point based on the old one, or you can also create a new save point just from scratch. 
And uh, I recommend uh, listening to Seth and Gordon's talk um, later today. I think it's the slot, um, two slots after this one. Yeah, so this, um, this is about application evolution. Um, so think a little bit ahead, choose the right data types, assign your UIDs, and you're good. When I thought, uh, when I th uh, said, think about the scale of your problem, I, I mainly mean, think about if whether you are, whether what you are trying to do is even remotely possible with the hardware that you think you have for that. Um, and this is not about an, an exact calculation. It's just typ typical back of napkin calculation of is this, does this even work or can this work? And the way this, this could look like, um, I, I quickly want to show you. So if we have a, a simple pipeline here, um, source, a key by, a stateful operator, and a sync. And we look at one task manager that has one parallel slot of this pipeline deployed. So there are n other task managers which have the same um, pipeline de uh, deployed, and together they're the flink job. Um, the two Two things that are usually, yeah, most most important to look at are network and um, state size. And state size means um, for checkpointing, but also um, memory in case of the file system state backend. So in this case, we use the file system state backend. So state size means the minimum amount of memory that you need for long-lived objects on the heap. And the state size, it's in this case, pretty easy to calculate. It's just the number of keys times, so the key, number of keys per task manager, so your overall key space divided by the number of task managers, times the size of an individual state object. And well, you can now start calculating, or uh, uh, can start yeah, going through all the calculation around uh, Java object overhead and so on, or you just make a rough estimate um, for each of your state objects, uh, what is the size, and um, you're good. We're just talking about ballpark numbers here. Um, then you have basically your memory requirements. There's a little bit of overhead, but the long-lived objects are mostly state. Now, when it comes to, to network, there's, of course, your initial ingress. So number of records per second times the size of the record. And again, only for part of your stream that goes to this task manager. Then there is a shuffle, and in the shuffle, most of the records will actually be sent to another task manager. So this again goes over the network, and this task manager receives um, events from um, the other task managers. And in the end, you have egress, and again, you have messages per second times the, the size of the record. Of course, the size of the record will change in each of these stages, depending on the transformations that you do, and the number of records changes in each of these stages, depending on what you do. If you do windowing, it will, for example, be very bursty, something that you can take into account or you can ignore it. Depends on how accurate you want to be. One thing that we have completely ignored and which you should not ignore, um, ignore is checkpointing. So depending on your state size and your throughput, this is actually the much, much bigger um, chunk um, of, of data. And um, so you take your overall state size, and this um, state needs to be sent to a distributed file system every checkpoint interval. So this will, again, also be more of a bursty load. And um, it will happen. Um, and the more often you checkpoint, the more network you need. So here, again, you if you come from your latency requirements and your, um, and your basically recovery SLAs, you roughly know how often do I need to checkpoint. And from that, you know how much do I need to be able to ship to my distributed file system. Then you also already know, okay, what will be the I/O load actually, the write load on this distributed file system that this individual thing job is calling. So go through these exercises a little bit, and yeah, don't worry about um, a factor of two. But if if you can get it right for a factor of ten, then then I think that's that's a good start. 
Last but not least, uh, I said don't don't care or don't think too much about your business requirements. I want to to highlight two um, yeah two two cases or two scenarios that that I've often seen, and um, which leads to yeah long long discussions. Um, so let's let's take this um, this requirement here. Um, so the user wants to to send an alarm when the number of transactions per customer exceeds the number of three in ten seconds. Um, reasonable requirement, um, but it's actually not so easy. So if events come in all for the same customer with the timestamp four, eight, eleven, uh, thirteen actually, <laughs> um, should I should I send an alarm now? No, now 11, now an alarm or not, 15, 21. So it's not, not immediately clear when you should send an alarm. And there are a couple of interpret, well, there are a lot of in interpretations, and some of them might be just use tumbling windows. 10 seconds aligned to the, um, to the epoch, uh, and then we only send an alarm for the 15 timestamp, because then in the window between 10 and 19, uh, we have seen three records. Or it could be something like a sliding window. This example here, 10 minutes, uh, 10 minutes with a five, uh, 10 seconds with a five second slide. Um, then we would actually send an alarm for the 11, um, or for 11 and for 15, once for the five to 14 window and once for the 10 to 19 window. Or it could be something more dynamic. It's probably closer to the truth here actually. Um, so for every event that comes in, we look back 10 seconds, and if there have been two other events within these two 10 seconds, then we send out the alarm. Then we would send out a lot more alarms. Um, but there are more questions, actually. So if we see the 13 here, do we wait for the watermark? Um, because there is another event coming with um, timestamp 11, and do we need to incorporate this, this into the alarm? Maybe. Um, if we see the 15 here, up here in the tumbling window case, do we send out the alarm right away or do we wait until the end of the window and then send an alarm if the count in that window was more than three? We don't know. Um, depends on, on the use case. And it's since you're, your stakeholders or your analysts probably not, um, not used to think about um, time that explicitly that that's something that comes with screen processing that you need to have these conversations and you need to be able to have these conversations that's totally fine um, it's difficult if you if you're in a situation where your development teams are actually not in a position to question such a requirement or to interpret the, such a requirement and then it's you basically yeah stuck with this requirement and don't really know what to do or what it means um, so yeah, make sure you can have these conversations. The other one is, um, is this one here. So um, the user receives two files every 10 minutes, transactions and quotes, and the requirements are they need to be transformed, they need to be joined, um, there needs to be exactly one output file, and this whole thing needs to be atomic. So either the whole file is there, everything has been processed, or nothing has been processed. If these really are your business requirements, probably just write a batch job um, with Flink or with any any other system, but it's not a good fit for a stream processing um, pipeline. It's just, um, yeah, it will just be artificially um, difficult. So when you make a change from a batch system to a stream processing um, system, take the step back, talk to the people who actually came up with the requirements in the first place, think, think about the actual business requirements and then model it as a continuous business process in a stream processor. Don't try to exactly re-implement your batch job as a stream processing job. This is just not worth it. And um, yeah, unnecessary, just unnecessary. <laughs> um, yeah, so we've made it through the analysis phase. These um, requirements are set in stone now and uh, we can start development. And yeah, this will this will now basically be a just a big basket of uh, gotchas and um, small tips uh, for Flink development. Um, it probably starts with choosing choosing an API. Um, mostly, you'll have the choice between the table API and SQL on the one hand, and the data stream API on the other hand. The 
high-level high story there is you use the data stream API uh, for applications, um, and you use the table API for analytics and for simple ETL jobs. A lot has to do with how you how you think about um, state types, how you think about schemas, um, depend uh, and how fine granular access to state and time you usually need in these classes of applications. There are a few gotchas though in the table API um, where even if you use if if you fall into the analytics category, you need to pay attention um, and. Yeah, I, I mainly see the following three. So if you if if you have thought about application upgrades and you know I want to carry over state, I don't want to lose state, then don't use the table API or SQL. Because in the a table API um, or in these declarative APIs, you don't know how your flink job will change if you change your query a little bit. There's the query optimizer, you make a small change to your, to your application or to your query, totally different flink job and not compatible anymore. Um, and there are currently no guarantees in Flink that, that uh, or, or there's no rule what kind of changes you can make to your query so that you can carry over state. If you cannot lose late data, so this is data that arrives after the watermark, then also don't use um, the table API or pay attention, let's, let's put it like that, because um, a lot of the operators in the table API or the joins in the table API um, discard late data um, and there is no hook for you to um, to change that. And the last one, if you want to change your application um, behavior during runtime, so if you have, for example, if you want to change the way your pattern recognition works or the change the way how you aggregate events um, without stopping the job, um, just by somehow injecting a trigger um, through a control stream, this is something that doesn't work in, in the table API. So start learning the data stream API right away. Data types. Um, so in this area, the, the two biggest um, best pra uh, worst practices are um, actually using the freedom that Flink gives you to use any data type, any Java object um, as a record or as a state um, type. So don't use deeply nested um, complex data, data types in particular, don't use something like a JSON node or an object node. Um, this is super expensive. Um, and um, keep your keys simple. Um, this has mostly to do with serialization. And serialization is a huge performance killer in a lot of applications. Um, it's actually not that important which serializer exactly you use. Um, you can get maybe a, a factor of three or so between Pojo and, and Cryo. It's more important that your data types are just simple, um, that you don't artificially blow them up, that they are not too deeply nested. Um, this will make a much bigger difference. Often these go hand in hand. If your data type is complicated, then Pojo doesn't work, then it falls back to Cryo. So if you change it so that po the Pojo data type, uh, Pojo serializer works, you simplify it and you see a, a throughput improvement of a uh, factor of 20 or so. Most of it is because you simplified your data type, not so much because of the serializer. But there are also differences between the serializers. And if you want to read more, um, my colleague Nico just started a new blog post seri uh, series on the Flink blog on serialization. Um, yeah, Flink Pojos and Afro specific records are the best for performance. They are also the best in terms of schema migration. So uh, this is kind of the go-to go -to classes. The key types matter the most in a lot of cases because they are serialized and deserialized for every state access in the case of heat state and timers are also key state. Um, so the key uh, the um, key is also part of every timer. Um, so yeah, make your key types very simple. Use strings or numbers um, or very small pojos with a string and a number. <laughs> um, if you if you want to tune uh, this, do it locally. Um, if you run your your application um, in your IDE at maximum throughput, so just write a small source that creates artificial data as fast as possible. Run it in your IDE, profile it. You'll see where um, which uh, which methods um, 
cost the most, probably it's going to be serialization and you can, can tune locally. Related to serialization, not really serialization exactly, is this example. So we have a source stream, um, we deserialize it, um, then we key by field cities and we count over uh, the time window and afterwards we filter for all the cities in America. Um, two problems here, if I only need the cities, um, if I only need the cities field, um, because I'm just counting, then I throw it away before um, actually doing the shuffle, before I do the key by. I throw everything else away uh, but the city. I also filter early. Um, I filter um, for all the cities of, in America before actually doing the key by, right up the source. The table API actually does all of that automatically for you, but um, we're in the data stream API here. If you cannot throw away the fields because you actually need to send them out in the end, but you don't use them within your Flink job, then one pattern that you that you can do if you want to optimize is you um, actually only keep deserialize the city and you keep the um, the rest of the record as a byte array. And if there are a couple of shuffles in that job, you avoid, um, basically avoid um, yeah maybe ten serializations or so of the whole record. And this can actually make quite a difference uh, depending on your job. So if you're looking for ways to optimize, that might be one. Concurrency. Um, large um, source of bugs and, and initial confusion for um, people coming um, new to, to the um, yeah, programming paradigm of Flink is that they use static variables to share state between tasks. And this has, has a couple of problems. First of all, it's buggy most of the time because it gives you the feeling that you have something like a global state, but it's not global, it's only in this JVM. So it's maybe, if you deploy two task slots, then it's two operators that share this one static variable and the other task manager is another two. Um, you can have all the concurrency bugs um, or all the threat safety issues if what you're sharing is not threat safe. Um, and um, yeah, you you might run into into deadlocks um, or lock contention issues, or basically performance issues uh, in case of the lock contention. The deadlocks might not even be your your fault, but it might also be that the framework um, acquires some lock, and you acquire some lock on your static variable, and in combination the two of them um, then create the deadlock. So um, next uh, next um, yeah anti pattern is spawning threads in your user functions. Um, here you yeah there's just no need to do that. Um, it's also again error prone because you um, basically circumvent Flink's mechanism of making sure that um, checkpointing and um, making sure that checkpointing and um, the processing of records don't interfere with each other. Um, and there's also no need for it. So if you want to spawn a thread because um, there's, um, you want to reduce wait times, then um, just use async streams. Um, there's a utility for that in the Flink, um, um, the Flink API that takes care of all of that. Um, if you, just want to schedule something or want to delay something, use timers and it will take care of all the management and that they are not lost. Um, if you just want to increase the parallelism, increase the parallelism. I think I only have six minutes left. Um, so we're definitely gonna skip testing. Um, the question, question is what else I'm gonna skip. I'm, I'm just gonna go on um, and there is already a recording um, on YouTube of um, a very similar talk that I gave in the past, um, and uh, we'll, we'll figure it out somehow. Um, so in terms of windowing, um, don't use custom windows. Um, basically, there's not, not much need to do that anymore. Uh, there's the key process function. Um, it's usually less error prone, simpler to write. You don't need to know that much about how window, your code and the framework code interact. 
first check whether you can do it with the process function. Um, if you use set your window um, where you have 30 day um, window with a five second slide and no pre aggregation, then every record will be in state 500,000 times. For every slice of the window, one time the re uh, each record will go into state um, once. So if you use pre aggregation, then it will still be 500,000 aggregates, but at least not 500,000 times, 500, times every record. So yeah, just be careful. Um, you could argue Flink should do that better. It do Flink doesn't do it better. Um, so you need to be careful um, and need to plan and need to think about how, what does it mean for my state size if I use sliding windows. Curlable state, I'm just gonna skip. There are stateful functions now. Use stateful functions if you want to do intertask communication. Um, and two data stream API classics. Um, if you want to key by the same key multiple times, don't use key by operator, key by operator, and so on. I know it's the only way kind of in the API to get a keyed stream again, um, but there is another met method uh, hidden in data stream utils um, called reinterpret as keyed stream. It will give you again a keyed stream um, or the keyed, keyed, stream, a keyed stream abstraction without actually keying. And um, yeah, just be careful. It really needs to be exactly the same way as before. Um, and yeah, then you save a couple of serializations. And the biggest performance killer uh, that yeah, I see in every second application um, unnecessary initialization code in the per, per record methods. Um, so this is probably a factor of 99 uh, or so that, that you're losing here. Um, so um, use the open method of the rich function interface uh, classes for that. So testing, I have a few slides, but we'll skip it. Um, that's how it is in software projects. Um, you can check out this um, repository here. I, I have an example of um, a well-tested Flink job or kind of well-tested Flink job um, on GitHub. Um, check it out and, and you'll avoid these. When it comes to go live, um, you probably uh, will think about some kind of spikiness in your load, especially the seasonal fluctuations and what comes from the business side, basically. If you think about your Flink job, then it might actually look like this because of windowing, because of timers being triggered. And then there's much more. Um, there's checkpoint alignment, there are watermark intervals, that um, there are garbage collection pauses, which, which all create these like small spikes. So when you test, test with um, under kind of real conditions, enable checkpointing, enable watermarking in a realistic way, um, generate some, some realistic test data, and don't ignore um, spiky load. In a re-catch-up scenario, the whole thing probably looks like that. And this basically means your whole business logic um, is squeezed in less time. You will have more state, you will have um, more windows open at the same, more keys at the same time, and your application will need to be able to deal with that. So before you go to production, Job your, uh, stop your job for three hours, let it reprocess three hours. If that goes well, you're good to go. But always test a reprocessing scenario before. Otherwise, this will blow up once it happens because you will need more memory, you will need more network in these scenarios. Don't start monitoring just now. Um, I think it's the, the best way to learn about the internals of Apache Flink is observing I change something in the application code. This is how I see that in the runtime via the metrics. And why is that the case? Asking these questions. So start monitoring early, um, check out the metrics, be curious about the changes that you see. And um, I wrote a blog post a year ago, um, how to start. Don't use the Flink web interface as a monitoring system. It's not the right tool. It's super inconvenient. Um, use Prometheus influx DBA data um, doc there. All the integrations are there. Um, actually, if you query the job manager, or if too many people query the job manager for metrics, this will just crash the job manager. And don't use latency markers in production. Um, 
yeah, they, they are heavy, a lot of histograms. Um, and again, um, probably also not what you actually want to measure, probably want to measure event time lag instead and not what comes through the um, latency markers. In terms of configuration, just three quick tips uh, at the end here. Um, don't cho uh, just choose RocksDB by default because it's the newer one and the one that has more capabilities. It's roughly 10 times slower than the file system back uh, state backend. It's harder to configure. Um, it's become much, much simpler now with Flink 1.10 and the new memory uh, management efforts, but still it's slower. So if you have the mem uh, if you have memory, why not use the file system state backend? Um, you can always change later with the state processor API. Um, if you're using RocksDB, don't use a slow file system for the local um, directory. It's local state. It should be local. It should be fast. Um, in the end, your um, state I/O is bound by how quickly RocksDB can compact its uh, SS tables, and that will just be slow on a on a network attached storage. Um, and don't play around with slot sharing groups very early. It should not be the first thing that you look at when you want to tune. In the streaming case, everything is in one slot sharing group, and this is actually a reasonable default um, for most of the cases. If you have, yeah, don't look at that first. Look at serialization first. Um, yeah, um, and now I'm in, at maintenance, and I'm out of time, and I only have one last um, tip. Just never upgrade um, uh, with a project like Flink, where there are bug fixes every day. Just stay at your Flink 1.43, um, and you're good to go. Yeah, um, I don't think I have time for questions. I see that there are maybe one. I don't know. Um, ah, there uh, it only popped up because uh, no, I think everything has been answered, right? Yeah, then thanks a lot for joining and uh, enjoy.